Will you pray with me as uh, we prepare our hearts to apply that text, this text that was read to us? Father, we are grateful that um, you are a loving God, that even in a day such as today with rain filled with water, um, we are reminded of your grace over our lives, that uh, uh, the world could have been destroyed with water, but it wasn't. It was preserved because of your unfailing, unending love towards us. And so uh, we pray that today as we uh, are reflecting upon these verses, Father, that you would deeply speak into our lives, into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you here today. Um, let me just get some business out of the way and then we'll get into the text. We have an amazing weekend coming up. Um, this has been an amazing weekend so far, but we have an amazing weekend coming up. Next Saturday, Jeff already announced, but I want to make a point to announce it again. We are holding beach baptisms, okay? Uh, and we're going to do that. We're going to do that with our uh, Brickle campus, and it's going to be amazing. So next Saturday in front of the beach club, you can park in the beach club. Go in through the beach club. We're going to be out on the, out on the beach. Uh, we're going to have beach baptisms. You can bring your own food and drink. Some of us are going to bring wine bottles, and we're going to have fun. There's uh, about, uh, I think, three or four from our church, including Eric. So my friend here is going to be baptized. I led him to Christ in our community group uh, in the last few weeks. And uh, Aloisio, Maida's husband, where is Aloisio? He's not here, but he's going to have to be there on Saturday. I don't care. I don't care. And uh, Gilberto, I don't see Gilberto here today, but, you know, these brothers are going to be baptized. If, if you still are interested in baptism, you haven't been baptized yet, you can talk to us um, and we will, you know, try to get to you this week so that we can get you there ready for Saturday. So I want all of you guys there Saturday. This is a, a landmark for this church because God is doing the work. He is drawing people to him. And uh, it's, it's, it's only... Uh, a reason. It's, that's a reason for us to celebrate and to party around that. Okay, so, and then on Sunday, we have an important congregational meeting after church, and you're invited to stay as well. All right, now back to the text. So we are closing our series on the book of Ecclesiastes today. It's a book that we've been into in the last couple months, and uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, we get to this very last chapter of the book. Chapter 12 is the last chapter, and he gives his conclusion of things. And here, here's what he says, and here is what he concludes. He says, this is the conclusion of all things. Number one, enjoy life. Live life to the fullest. That's what he says in chapter 11. Enjoy your work. and Enjoy the labor of your hands. I hope you can do that. Find a vocation that you were called to do and invest your life in it. Invest your life in relationships. Uh, enjoy the graces and the blessings that God puts in your lives. People, travel, eat well, right? These are very good things. Enjoy life, but enjoy life remembering God. Don't try to enjoy life without God because these things that are sweet will turn into bitterness. If you put God out of the picture, if you throw God out of the picture, but if you're able to remember God, you know, all of it will become sweeter. It reminds me of a, an experience that I had in Spain. Um, I think last year I was there with a group of, of friends from our church. And uh, we went to this, um, this town by the name of San Sebastian. Some of the best restaurants are in San Sebastian. And uh, somebody uh, gave us the opportunity to go to a, one Michelin star uh, restaurant. I've never been to a Michelin star restaurant. Went to a Michelin star restaurant. And the cool thing is that, you know, it's a, I think it was a five-course or a six-course meal, and they pair every dish with a specific wine. And it's amazing, right? You eat the food without the wine, but then when you taste the wine and eat the food, it's, it takes it to a whole other level, right? It enhances everything. And that's what he means is if you're able to remember God, you know, life becomes sweeter. That's why in verse 1 he says, remember also, because he has been talking about in verse 11, on chapter 11, the previous chapter, enjoy life. But he says, remember also your creator. So it's a balanced approach to life, right? It's a very balanced approach to life. But the main thing for us to understand today, because I know that you guys know how to have fun, right? So I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to spend time uh, talking about that. But what I want to spend time talking about this morning is how do you remember God? What does it mean, number one, to remember God? What does it mean? Uh, number two, why are we to remember God? And then lastly, how are we to remember God? All right, so first, 
What does it mean to remember God? See, the word for remember in the Hebrew is a very different word than uh, we think it is in our English language. So this comes from a Hebrew word that's pronounced zakar. And zakar uh, has less to do with uh, a recollection of facts, has less to do with uh, an intellectual or mental activity. It has more to do with a heart condition that moves you towards action. It's not so much something of the mind, but it's something of the heart. Zakar is something of the heart. To remember is an activity, not of the mind in the Bible, but to remember in the Bible is something of the heart. It's an activity of the heart. I, I was reading a, uh, a, a scholar in Old Testament literature, and, and this is what he says about this word zakar, this word remember in the Bible. He says this, uh, in, in the Bible, here's a quote, in the Bible, remembering particularly on the part of God, is not retention or recollection of a mental image, but a focusing upon the object of memory that results in action. Okay, let me break that down with two examples from the Bible. The first one comes out of the book of Genesis in chapter 30. You know that Jacob, we talked about Jacob here, um, you know, earlier in the year, but Jacob was a man that had two wives. He had a wife that he did not really love, his first wife, Leah, and Leah was very fruitful and gave Jacob a lot of children. But the wife that he really loved, a woman by the name of Rachel, was barren. She was not able to give Jacob any children. That was a source of misery for her because in uh, those days, in that culture, they had no value if they were not able to bear children. And so she prayed to God. She lived a life of anguish until one day, right, in chapter 30, God hears her prayer. And, and this is what we read. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. So think about this. It's not that God was saying, hey, <laughs> Uh, 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 you're second. Uh, let, me, let me just worry about Leah right now. Let me just make sure she has all the children that she needs, right? And, and then, you know, God got so busy with Leah and other things in, in heaven that he was like, oh, my gosh, I forgot you, <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> all right, I mean, it's been a long time. Now it's your turn. I'm going to give you a child. It's not that God forgot her in the back of his mind. It's, it's, it's that God took it to heart, her condition. God showed compassion and mercy and grace towards her and gifted her a son. God remembered her. Here's an example from the New Testament. You find this in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews is a book of the, of the New Testament. And the writer of Hebrews is quoting uh, the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, right? And, and he's talking about the character of our God, a God that always has to relate to a people that is unfaithful. Even though he's faithful, his people is unfaithful. Even though he's a perfect God, his people is a broken people. But then God has a promise uh, of restoration towards his people. And it goes this way. He says, for I will be merciful. This is God speaking to his people. I will be merciful towards the iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So the first example that I gave you was a positive example, God remembering Rachel and showing her passion and mercy. Uh, here's a second example from the negative, God choosing not to remember the sins and the iniquities of his people so that he can be merciful and gracious to them, right? And so it's not like God forgets our sins or the bad things that we do because he has a short memory. It's just that he chooses not to take it to heart and act upon it. And he chooses, therefore, instead to demonstrate mercy and love and in grace. So when it comes to us, this is what remembering means in the context uh, of what we're talking about for God. But what about for us? What does remembering mean for us? What does remembering our creator really mean? See, there's a lot of people that know a whole lot about God, and there's a lot of Christians that I know that they know a lot of things about God. They've read many books about God. They've heard many sermons about God. They've been to church a lot. They know a lot about God. If you were to ex ask them to explain a Christian doctrine, they would be able to explain a Christian doctrine to you because they understand it. They know about God. They know verses of the Bible. They've memorized verses. But it's an activity sometimes solely of the mind. It's not of the heart. It's never dropped from the head to the heart. So they remember Bible verses and they remember, you know, uh, Christian dogma. And, and they, they remember all sorts of things. But it's not something that's real to us or real to them. It's not something that's part of who they are. So to remember your creator means 
Have God at the core of your being. Have him as the ultimate object of your affections, your main love. It's not enough to know about God. You have to love God, and you have to know God at an intimate, in an intimate way. It means to pursue him as the ultimate thing in your life, to put him first. That's what it means to remember God. It means to have him as your greatest good. What comes first in your life is that which is in your heart, that which you remember. There are certain things in life that we do not forget, and those are the things that are most valuable to us. The Apostle Paul was a man that remembered God in the sense of what we're talking about here. In the book of Philippians, in the very first chapter, he says this about his own life. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ is to live for God. To remember God means to have him at the most fundamental and important part of you and to live for him. The Apostle Paul says, this is what my life is characterized by, to live for Christ. And to die is gain. Why? Because if I die, I'm with Christ. And if I live, I'm with Christ. And Christ is my main object of affections. If I live, it's good for you because I'm helping you. It's good for your own spiritual development. If I die, I'm with Jesus. It's all good. That's what it means to remember your creator. Now, why ought, ought to we remember our creator? Why? And he gives us three basic reasons here in the verses that we read. And I'm just going to go through them real fast. Number one, uh, we are to remember our creator because life is lived best with him, with God. Life is lived best with God. You know, some people live good lives, fun lives, but life is lived best with him. Regardless of how good your life is, it can always be better with God. Why? Because, look. In verse 1, look at what he says, remember also your creator. He calls God creator. And in verse 7, go to verse 7, he says this, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So here's what he's talking about here. He is recognizing in God our creator that created us with a purpose. And then he describes, he says, "I, I want you to do that before stuff starts to happen. The cycle of life takes hold of you. And then in verse 7, he says, he he arrives to the point of death, something that will come to all of us here. By the way, I I want to bring up the fact that we have a a, a dear member of our church, Ricardo. He's in in Chile right now. He just lost his dad. He asked me to share this with you guys. Pray for him. Pray for his family. But what he is experiencing in terms of loss of a loved one, it it will come to all of us. And, And he says, you know, when that happens... Dust will return to dust. Why? Because he's referring to our our creation narrative in in Genesis 1 and 2 that when God created Adam, God created Adam out of dust, out of the dust of the ground. When we die, that's the first thing that happens, that dust goes to dust. Our bodies disintegrate and becomes dust again, and the spirit goes back to God who has given us the spirit. See, after God creates Adam out of dust, he breathes in his nostrils, and then there's life. It's breathed light from God. And so our spirits return to God. And so he, what he's saying is, here's why life is lived best with God, because it's living life according to our operational manual, right? You know, in Genesis, it says that we were created by God and for God. I love our, um, I love our, our shorter catechism in our church. The first question and then the first answer to that catechism. The first answer is, the first question is, what is the chief end, end of men? Why were we created? And then the answer is, man, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's why you were created. You were created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's the only way that life is lived at best is when you are able to live life with God in it, making God a priority. But then he says in, verse, uh, in verses 1 through 6, right, here's a second reason why we ought to remember our creator. It's not only because we were created by God and for him to enjoy him. And unless 
we enjoy him. We can't fully enjoy anything else. But life is really, really short. See, in verses, from verses 1 through 6, he's talking about, you know, the last stage of everyone's life. Look, and it's, he, he, he talks about it in a very poetic way. I know that when Jeff was reading it to us, some of you were like, what is he talking about, right? But, but let me explain to you and show you the beauty in this Hebrew poetry. Um, he, he says this, before the sun, like verse 2, starting in verse 2, before the sun and the light, and the moon, and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. What is he talking about here? You're losing your eyesight. You know, you, you, you now have to, after, after a while, you, first you have like perfect vision, and then you have to buy glasses, right? Because it's not perfect. And then, you know, you have to get thicker glasses. And, uh, and then even the glasses don't work anymore because you start to lose your sight. And in verse 3, he says, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble, you know, biblical commentators talk about that being our knees. You know, you're, you start to lose um, muscle strength and your joints start to give way. I begin to feel that way already. I don't know about you, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm 41. I'm beginning to feel that way. And some of you are looking at me, it's like, Man, son, you have no idea what's coming. No idea what's coming. And the strong men are bent. So here's that you start to curve, right? When you get older, your uh, your spine starts to uh, lose strength, and the grinders seize because they are few. So what he's talking about? Your teeth start losing your teeth. The grinders, that's your grinders. And those who look through windows are dim. It goes back again to the eyesight vision. Loss of vision. And then verse 4, and the doors of the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low. So meaning now you're losing your, your hearing. You have to buy devices to help you to hear. And one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of the you start You start waking up like at 4 a.m., like older people. The older you get, the earlier you start to get up. Right? That's what he's talking about here. And then they are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way because you start contemplating death. And then finally, there is a, uh, a picture of death. And he says, um, the almond tree blossoms, and the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the street. Now you're dead. The mourners are about the street. Before the silver cord is snapped, that's a picture of death, when a silver cord snaps. Or the golden bowl is broken, that's another picture of death. And the picture is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, that's a picture of death. And he says, don't wait for this time, don't wait for this season to start remembering your creator. Do it now. (laughs) If life is lived best with God, give him your best years, not your worst years. But give him your best years. I'm not saying that old age is bad. You know, in fact, my mom was telling me the other day, she's 70. She's saying, you know, son, you have no idea. When you go to church, worship is, is, is a lot more meaningful when you get to my age. And spending time with people and your children and grandkids is a lot more meaningful. You have no idea. I, I, know, I know there's like a lot of great things, you know, that are part of, um, you know, that stage of life. But what I'm saying is the energy, you know, is gone. And so he's saying you want to give God the time of your life where you have the most amount of energy. Don't save the best for last here. Live the best now, right? You know, I, I, uh, I remember this today because of this rain, and I, I remember a conversation that I had with a friend uh, from our church in Pinecrest during Hurricane Irma. We were in, we were in Orlando taking refuge, and uh, I was like, man, I have all these things that I left in my house, and I didn't have the time to, uh, to put it away. You know, I, I have these, uh, these wine bottles that I received as a gift in my 40th birthday. And, and uh, I don't know, you know, it's in the cooler. It's, we're going to run out of power. It's going to, you know, ruin all that good wine. And he says, yeah, man, I learned it. I learned that the last hurricane I had all this good wine and I saved it up and I lost it all. So I drink it all today. Right? <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> I learned never to save the best for last. I always own the moment, and I live what's best now, right? Especially with God. And so that's what he's saying. Life is short. And then ultimately, look, ultimately, what he's saying is that, 
you know, we, we've considered life without God and life without God throughout the book. And it says, living life without God in the picture is a meaningless life for several reasons. Go listen to the previous sermons. But he says, you know, here's why it, 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 it's worth it to live a life for God because eternity is always in view. In the last verse that we read, verse 14, he says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. See, God has given you a lot of great things in your life, especially the breath that you currently breathe today. Air in your lungs. It's all God that has given you. But for, for many of you, he has given you a story. He has given you uh, possessions. He has given you gifts and talents. He has given you people in your life. And he wants you to steward those things well for him. And the more you steward those things well for him, the more you will enjoy all those things. And what he says is here in, the, in, in this verse is, one day, by the way, all of us will die and will stand before God. And you're going to have to give account to how you stewarded the things that he has given you, including your life. Every single one of us. In the book of Hebrews, it says that to man it's given to live once. You can't come back to this life in another incarnation. It's to live once, and after that follows judgment. Every single one of us is going to have to look our creator in the eyes and he says, hey, but that talent and that gift that I give you, those opportunities, what did you do with them? Oh, I enjoy them in the present, but they have all been wasted because you've never utilized that which God has given you with the mindset that what you do here affects eternity. And therefore, because you only lived in the now, you've wasted your life. And that's why in verse 8, he says, vanity of vanity, he says, oh, the preacher, oh, it's vanity. His life is passing. Our lives are passing. Everything that we have is passing. And unless you make the most out of it, meaning live and use the things that God has given you now with eternity in mind, it's all a waste. Um, I, I love that scene in, in, in uh, The Gladiator, that old movie, right? Where uh, Russell Crowe, who plays this uh, Roman general, is summoning his troops and motivating them into battle. And he say, he's, he, 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 uh, there's a line there that's, that's very powerful. He goes, men, what we do here today echoes into eternity. Remember that? And it's true. What if everything that we do today echoes into eternity? Wouldn't there be more intentionality on how you live your life now? If you knew that how you spend your money can affect the eternity of people. The, the way in which you spend your time can affect your eternity and the eternity of others. Wouldn't that change how you see things today and how you use and go about things today. He says that's a big reason for why we ought to remember our creator. But then lastly, how do we do that? Because it's not easy to push that which is in the head down into the heart. And the answer is in verse 13. I covered this the last time I preached it says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So he starts off in the very first verse saying, we ought to remember our creator. He says in verse 13, now here's how you remember your creator. By learning to fear him and to obey him. And what I've said the last time I preached, I said this about these two things. That they are joined at the hip. That in order to obey Faithfully, you need to learn how to fear God. And the more you obey, you will fear God. Interchangeable. One thing helps the other. And what I said about fearing God is that the Bible, when the Bible talks about fearing God, it's not being afraid of God. See, to be afraid is a self-centered sort of feeling. You're trying to protect yourself. It is natural. I'm not saying it's sinful, but it's, it's, it's self-serving. But to fear God is to be in a constant state of awe and wonder towards him. The focus is not yourself now, but your focus is on someone else. It's the type of feeling that you have when you go into a, you know, 
into a beautiful sight of nature, like you're, you're before a mountain, like a highest mountain. You're standing there at the cliff, and there's that sense of fear and awe and wonder, right? Because you're impressed and you respect, right, that sight and that natural, that, that, that natural um, created thing that God has made, such as a mountain. There's this sense of awe and wonder. And it's just how much more should we have that sense of awe and wonder towards our maker and our creator? Because when you, look, when you are filled with a sense of awe and wonder for who God is, it becomes easy for you to obey and submit. It's not force. You're not doing it out of guilt. You're not doing it out of compulsion. You're not doing that, you're not doing that out, out of obligation. But you're doing it because you're filled with a sense of awe and wonder for who he is. And then when you... Uh, but in order, like I said, in order for you to be filled with this sense of awe and wonder, there are certain spiritual disciplines that you have to be able to develop in your life. And that's, that's obedience. And I can think about three today just to apply it real fast. Number one, you should not neglect personal worship. You know what personal worship is? Is carving out a certain amount of time each day to go to your Bible and open your Bible, read and pray. Oh, but I don't feel like it sometimes, and I don't feel anything when I do it. Do it. It's obedience. It's spiritual discipline. And it's going to help you to get to a place of awe and wonder so that you can remember your creator. Here's another discipline that we should not neglect. Being in community with other believers. Not, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about Sundays. I'm talking about during the week, being with others. Rehashing the faith. And sharing your stories with one another. Breaking bread with one another. Here's another one that you should not neglect. Corporate worship. What we're doing right now. And I may applaud some of you to come out with this weather. All right. I applaud you. You should not neglect corporate worship. Corporate worship is designed to reset your hearts. And to, and to reorder the loves in your lives. The priorities. So that you can be in a state of awe and wonder towards God. Remember him and therefore live life to the fullest. See this is what you're doing with these spiritual disciplines. And there are many others. But this is what you're doing. You're pushing down what's on your head back and you know, down into your heart. Every time you read the Bible you don't feel like it. You're pushing it a little deeper. Every time you go to community, even though when you're busy and you don't feel like being with people and hearing people's stories, you're pushing it deeper. Every time you come to church when there's a bad weather and you still come anyway, what you're doing is you're pushing that belief a little deeper. And it's like a dynamite being pushed into a, the core of a boulder. Eventually, when you detonate it, the whole thing is going to explode. In order for you to, to be in a state of constant awe and wonder for God, you have to do these things. They're mutual. Obedience leads to fear of God, and fear of God leads to obedience. It becomes natural, and it's not forced, and it changes us. And because it begins to show you what the gospel is, it reminds you of the gospel. Every Sunday, we're reminding you of the gospel. In community, you should be reminded of the gospel. On a daily basis, you should be reminded of the gospel, preaching it to yourself, right? In this context, how does the gospel speak to us? When we should have been forgotten, we were remembered. And what should have been remembered was forgotten. Meaning, because of our sins, God should have forgotten us. But the gospel tells us that God remembered us. On the cross, Jesus took our sins and he was forgotten on our behalf so that we could be remembered by God. And what should have been remembered, our sins, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, it was forgotten. And we were forgiven. And to the degree that, you know, you begin to understand the beauty of the gospel, you begin to be restored of this sense of awe and wonder. You begin to fear God so that you have the power to remember him today and every day. And sing like Isaac Watts, right? When he surveyed the wondrous cross, he starts that hymn. We sing it here sometimes. He's surveying the wondrous cross. He's thinking about the cross of Christ. And here's what he concludes. He says... Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It demands all of us. So think about that today. This is time, not tomorrow, but today is time to remember God. Let's remember him. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the gospel. Allow us to set our hearts 
on the gospel, Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. And out of that, Father, remember you. We want to live for you, not tomorrow. We want to live for you today. We don't want to live for things in this life that are fleeting or passing. But we want to live for that which is eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.